Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, we're going to begin the funeral services for Rabbi Mark S. Shapiro. If you have a cell phone, respectfully ask you to please turn it off. Officiating this morning is Rabbi Karen Kadar, Cantor Jennifer Frost, and Rabbi Jason Fenster. In just a moment, the rabbi will lead the family to the ceremony of Kriya. Birth is a beginning, and death a destination. But life is a journey, a going, a growing from stage to stage, from childhood to maturity and youth to age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowing, from foolishness to discretion, and then, perhaps, to wisdom, from weakness to strength, or strength to weakness, and often back again, from health to sickness, and back we pray to health again. From offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, 
from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion, and grief to understanding, from fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat until looking backward or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but in having made the journey, stage by stage, a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning, and death a destination. But life is a journey, a sacred pilgrimage made stage by stage from birth to death to life everlasting. The 23rd Psalm. Adonai Rohi Lo The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life, and you shall dwell in the house of the Lord 
forever. This prayer I started reading after Rabbi Shapiro taught me to do so. In his sorrow, Job, Job cried out, Adonai Natan, Adonai Lakach, Yehi Shem, Adonai Mevarach, which means God has given, God has taken away. Blessed be the name of God. We are an ancient people, well acquainted with grief in the valley of shadows, death, and sorrow are no strangers to us, yet the centuries have taught us this, that a good name endures beyond the grave. I understand right now why he always read that. And then it goes on to say, and there is strength in faith. And I understand why he wanted to read that as well. So now we say with Job, Adonai Natan, God, you gave us somebody who was so beloved. For all that was good in his life, we offer the deepest thanks of our hearts. But Adonai Lakach, and God, you have taken him away. So we pray for strength so that we can turn our broken hearts into an altar of faith and love and say, Yehi Shem Adonai Mevarach, blessed be the name of God, now and forever. So though I was a member of this congregation before I was its rabbi, I was never really a member of his congregation. And I would only hear it and see glimpses of it. I would, of course, remember that voice, but I imagined, I don't know, how does any good moment, any good sermon begin in the Rabbi Shapiro world? Probably with a little bit of a shift from one side to another, a awkward, maybe pregnant pause, and then the request that you close your books so that you could settle in and listen to what he had to say. Or, I don't know, maybe we began this way, because it seemed like every single sermon, I got to admit, this is one that I did not quite understand, and to this day don't quite understand, but out of enormous love and respect, we're going to go ahead and do it. Every sermon, particularly the high holiday sermons, began with some reference to the White Sox. And there you have it, reference to the White Sox. Anna, please. We've also gotten a note from uh, Royce Flansky and Eric Shore, two longtime White Sox fans, honoring uh, their beloved Mark Shapiro, their rabbi of congregation BJBB in Deerfield, who has recently passed away. Big Sox fans with a big loss to the White Sox family. And to those of you who knew Rabbi Shapiro, our condolences to you as well. Thank you, Anna. Rabbi, I paid homage to, to your other congregation in that moment. Or maybe, as I have learned, every sermon, particularly High Holiday Sermon, began with a poem about time. For years, I didn't know about this poem. I heard about it. I couldn't find a copy of it. I didn't read it. And then suddenly, it had come into my world. And so, Elliot, do you mind coming up and reading this poem about time? Because it's also the way he'd like us to begin. This reading is not in your books. I went out, Lord. People were coming and going, walking and running. Everything was rushing. Cars, trucks, the street, the whole town. People were rushing, not to waste time. They were rushing after time, 
to catch up with time, to gain time. Goodbye, sir. Excuse me. I haven't time. I'll come back. I can't wait. I haven't time. I must end this letter. I haven't time. I'd love to help you, but I haven't time. I can't accept having no time. I can't think. I can't read. I'm swamped. I haven't time. I'd like to pray, but I haven't time. You understand, Lord, they simply haven't the time. The child is playing. She hasn't time right now. Later on. The schoolboy has his homework to do. He hasn't time. Later on. The student has her courses and so much work. Later on. The young couple has their new house. They have to fix it up. They haven't time. Later on. The grandparents have their grandchildren. They haven't time. Later on. They are ill. They have their treatments. They haven't time. Later on. They are dying. They have no. Too late. They have no more time. And so all people run after time, Lord. They pass through life running, hurried, jostled, overburdened, frantic, and they never get there. They haven't time. In spite of all their efforts, they're still short of time, of a great deal of time. Lord, you must have made a mistake in your calculations. There's a big mistake somewhere. The hours are too short. Our lives are too short. You who are beyond time, Lord, you smile to see us fighting it. And you know what you are doing. You make no mistakes in your distribution of time to us. You give each of us time to do what you want us to do. But. We must not lose time, waste time, kill time, for it is a gift that you give us, but a perishable gift, a gift that does not keep. Lord, I have time. I have plenty of time, all the time that you give me. The days of my life, the days of my life. The days of my years, the hours of my days. They are all mine. Mine to fill quietly, calmly, but to fill completely up to the brim. Precious that is that Rabbi's son comes up and speaks the words that he spoke to all of us all those years. Noah, will you come up please and say a few words? One thing was perfectly clear to Natalie, Rosie, and me when we were young. Our Grandpa Mark knew everyone in the world. Everywhere we went, someone would say, Hi, Rabbi, or we'd look over to see him in conversation with someone. But as we grew up, we came to realize that there were only two places where this was absolutely true, here at BJBE and at Max and Benny's. He did, though, try very, very hard to convince us that he did, in fact, know everyone. Because in a retrospect, he would talk to people even if he didn't know them. Natalie remembers every time that she came to visit and he would pick her up from the airport, he would stop at the toll booth and tell the person inside, this is my granddaughter Natalie and she's visiting from Minneapolis. 
Grandpa also used to take Rose and me on walks around the restaurant whenever we went out to dinner. One night, we made up nicknames for ourselves. I was Polly Canerco, and she was Esor. And on our walk, he introduced us to who we thought, he, people who we thought he knew, who ended up being complete strangers. He lovingly announced, these are my grandkids, Polly and Esor, and wished them a good rest of their meal. In his own unique way, he taught us to be friendly and outgoing, qualities that stick with us today. In addition to being the devoted rabbi that you all know so well, he was also an incredibly devoted grandfather. When each of us was little, we would spend entire days with Grandpa Mark. He helped me funnel my creativity and love for words into writing stories and plays. We still have a folder overflowing with every story that we wrote, which I read to him in his final days. Another example of his devotion was him trying so desperately to spread his love for the White Sox onto all three of us. Even though he got three singers and actors instead of baseball players for grandkids, he took us to games galore, bribing us with hot dogs and funnel cakes. He even organized a visit from Southpaw for my fifth birthday, which I will always remember. When each of us was born, he lovingly showed up to meet us for the first time with a sack of toys and games slung over his shoulder, full of stuff we wouldn't be able to play for years, but he was just so excited to be a grandpa. He really loved being a grandpa in all senses of the job. As young kids, each of us would spend days on end with him. Every day, he would take us on a scavenger hunt around the house, and waiting for us at the end was our favorite stuffed hedgehog, Schlesley, who had some tchotchke or a Tootsie Pop waiting for us. As Rose got interested in the Transformers movies, Grandpa finally agreed to watch one with her. He shared later that he had no idea what was going on, but he really enjoyed watching Rosie enjoy it. <laughs> Natalie remembers every time that she visited and went to Temple, he would always glowingly acknowledge her from the Bema. He and my grandma even had a play ice cream shop built into their basement for us, and he had no shortage of customer characters up his sleeve, even if they all had the same voice. <laughs> One of his greatest qualities was his sense of adventure. Some favorite trips of ours were to Disney World, the Disney Cruise, where he even went on the clear aqueduct water slide with me, which went over the side of the ship, and his dream trip, taking the entire family to Israel for his 80th birthday. We are all so grateful to have memories with him in a place that he was so passionate about. I think every day about how lucky I am to have been able to walk up to the Western Wall for the first time holding my grandpa's hand. But maybe the most important thing he did for the three of us was teaching us important lessons without, even, without us even realizing it. Some were direct, such as the time where four-year-old Noah wanted some of the blue slushy that they sold at the Arlington Park racetrack. And Grandpa got down to my level and looked me in the eyes and said, that stuff is whiskey, and whiskey is bad. Other lessons were more by example, whether teaching us to be gentle with their beloved kitty cats, or teaching a Jewish lesson at a Seder or Hanukkah party, or how he used to take me on calls with him when he was a hospice rabbi to visit close friends such as Val Rabin. These trips gave me the ability to treat people, especially the elderly, with respect, taught me to be open-minded and to be accepting of someone's physical differences. Even in his declining days, Grandpa was still the same Grandpa. On her most recent visit, Grandpa Mark said to Natalie, Maybe next time you visit, we can go see a ball game together. I hope that wherever he is now is full of peace, Tootsie Pops, especially the red ones, and an eternal winning streak for the White Sox. Thank you, Noah. That was that was beautiful, and with one of the great lessons that I learned in this congregation coming in was a lesson that he must have taught, which he is living right now, and the lesson of generations. In fact, our eternal light has inscribed in it the words, Lador Vador, because this 
was a powerful lesson of Rabbi Shapiro. Lador Vador from generation to generation, we will offer your praise. We will embrace one another. Lador Vador, may we be blessed. The door of a door, the door of a door, the door of a door, the Le dor of a dor, le dor of a Nibhinu lo yamush leolam avad Meshiv rachu Aloheinu Nibhinu lo yamush leolam avad Ledor Every life is a story, an interesting story, a complicated story, a complex story. Every life is a story, as is Rabbi Mark Shapiro's life, a story filled with blessing, twists and turns and shadows, filled with love and giving, filled with light, filled with silent despair, filled with strong, strong legacy, a story that he himself told over and over again and now bears repeating in this moment. Born in 1935, not an easy time to come into this world. 1935 when things were difficult and there was struggle. Born to Marvin and Grace, many of you knew them. And Ben, you have told me stories. Mark has told me stories. And I hope that you will continue to tell the stories of your parents. From what I understand, Grace was a loving person filled with sweetness. Just as her name, so was she. And Marvin had an edge, sometimes tough, sometimes present sometimes not. Now, I haven't heard a lot of those stories about the marriage of Marvin and Grace, but I can imagine that there are many, and those are stories, Lador Vador, that we need to keep telling 
and many of which you have written down and have heard in his own voice. And then there was the grandmother, Ma'am, otherwise known as Anna, or Anna, otherwise known as Ma'am. Mark shared a room with her. And that must have been a full house, a complicated house, a crowded house. Ben born many years later. And the two of you couldn't have been more different as children and years apart as well. Mark was brilliant, that we know. Not particularly athletic. Completed high school, I think you told me, in two years? At age 16, already at the University of Chicago. Didn't stand a chance socially. So much ahead of his time intellectually. Mickey and Buddy, they used to call you. Until one day, your father, Ben, stood up and said to you, you know what, you boys are not close. And you must be close. Le door of a door. This is a legacy that has to go on. You will have only each other. And so rather late in life, I think, Ben, you said you were actually 50. The two of you went, 30. The two of you went to a restaurant. And you talked for hours and hours and hours. And you cried. And you forgave. And this whole legacy of Rabbi Shapiro understanding what redemption means by making peace in relationships came into your relationship. And at a young age, 22, I believe, and you were a mere 18, he met the love of his life. He was a third year rabbinic student, again, ahead of his time. You were from Cincinnati. He was there studying. He approached you, I said, when we were talking, I guess it was yesterday already, what did, he, what did he see in you? And Ben piped up right away, as only a brother would know. She was beautiful, gorgeous. He said to you, I understand we're going to be at camp together. And as the story goes, which, by the way, you don't buy into, but I kind of believe the story nevertheless, you turned on your heels and said, oh, really? And walked the other way. He said, well, you know, who needs it? And there you were at camp. You were the assistant waterfront director. He was the song leader. Everybody knows the song leader at camp rules the roost. And there were a couple pictures, two pictures, four pictures, three pictures. I don't know. You weren't quite sure. But what you were sure about these pictures is at the beginning of the summer, you were sitting there, and he was sitting there. And as the pictures progressed over the summer, you were coming closer and closer and closer to one another. You had an evening off. You went out to dinner. But there was a third person with you, so you were a threesome at this dinner. And it was wonderful. You clicked, just like that. So after dinner, you went into the forest of Asrui, down the paths, which so many of us know and have been there sneaking away so that nobody would really see what you were doing at night when you were supposed to be with the kids, perhaps. And you walked, and you held hands. And Hannah, all night, I could not get that image out of my mind. The two of you, holding hands. And it's not that it's been easy, but you never let go. You never let go of one another. You went on a date. I think you said it was the last day of camp. You went to Chicago. He was going to take you to the train, impress you with his father's Cadillac. He took a wrong turn. Your kids say, Ma, he did not take a wrong turn. He knew every turn. He purposely got lost. You needed to spend the night at Grace and Marvin's house. Met her for the first time. Your mother was not happy. Next morning, he took you back, and you went to Cincinnati. And you dated the whole year. And then came camp again, another summer. And there were a, a couple of false engagements. Once, he actually 
was told, you were told that he was going to bring you a present, and you thought, maybe this was it, maybe this was it, and you opened up the present, and it was a clock radio, <laughs> which apparently Mark liked to give to all his girlfriends. But that last night at camp, it was sealed. You were engaged. 61 years, right? 61 years. Why? Because you were beautiful in his eyes. And you had fun. And you laughed. And it was comfortable to be together. And he was kind. And you weren't always around a lot of kind people, but he was consistently kind. And he trusted you. He didn't always trust people, but you, he found security and trust. And he was genuine, real, and he was interesting, and he was interested. Ordination took you to Buffalo. Wasn't a good fit for Rabbi Shapiro. He wasn't a great assistant. I kind of understood that. Some of us really are not good at number two. And it was difficult in Buffalo for him, and so he made his way home. He wanted to come home. He felt that home was a place that he could once again find his equilibrium and his balance. He found BJ, BJ, which he thought was a great community of people, but you ended up in the wrong neighborhood didn't particularly feel comfortable in that neighborhood. Those were not good years for you, Hannah. Two children, difficult years, feeling a little bit alienated in Buffalo and you feeling a little bit alienated on the south side. And then came the promised land, Glenview, Illinois. I can't actually believe that I said that. <laughs> and you found your footing there. And he became the rabbi of this magnificent congregation, and it became a magnificent congregation because you and your family embedded yourself here. David was born, three children, an exciting time, a time that people remember as if it was yesterday, from BJ to BJWE, from Ashland to, to churches and to bowling alleys, to the trunk of your car, which was a library, or maybe a holy ark with a Torah scroll, to 901, to 901 that was kind of like a roller skating rink, empty inside where you would just go around in circles and circles, to the wait list, which was a badge of honor. People still introduce me. Hi, my name is so-and-so. I made it in just under the waiting list. That's their claim to fame. I was able to get into this congregation that nobody could come into. This congregation, you had to be a mensch to be here. Or maybe because of the congregation, you became a mensch. Down to earth place where community was real, not just a slogan or something on the stationery. Central. BJBE at 901 Milwaukee was a destination for holiness. People came from Park Ridge, Glenview, Wheeling, Arlington Heights, Deerfield, Buffalo Grove, Northbrook, Highland Park, etc., etc. They found you because they wanted him and the congregation that could make you, allow you to be who you were. He was your rabbi. He stood by your side at every celebration. Pictures that are yellowed are all over the internet right now. Snapshots of B'nai Mitzvah, of weddings, of him leaning over with a ketubah signing. Pictures of camp with him in jeans with a guitar in his hands, the song leader, the program director, the guy who would sit on the lawn with you and talk to you about things that mattered so and more, so important to you. The guy who would sneak into the bunk where his own kids were sleeping and kind of spend the night in the bunk just to be there. He understood that Olin's slang was a, 
extension of religious school, that it transformed lives, that it made you sure and made you a Jew. He was fanatical about camp. And then there's the famous bet that, uh, that I would have loved to have seen with Rabbi Wolko of B'nai Yehuda. We had the larger congregation, so Mark would spot him 15 and they would compete as to who could get more people with camp. By the way, when I came here, I tried to find somebody with the same bet and for a while we were definitely number one, number two, usually with Lombard. Leo lost, which meant one. Well then how did his picture get on the Yom Kippur? Okay, this is a story that I, there's something about Yom Kippur a picture on the bima, a kind of inappropriate bima, or picture. He could see you. He knew who you were. He'd tap you on the shoulder and he'd say, you, you need to be a teacher. You, you need to be an educator. Definitely a rabbi. You should be a cantor. You. You may not like to come to services, but can you make a sandwich for the poor? Because that, too, is prayer. He had a way of seeing who you were and drawing you in and making you better at being yourself. He was the social action rabbi, passionate about social change, making it to Selma for the second march. Rabbi Bob Marks was the regional director of what was then the UAHC. I'm taking a bus down. Rabbi, would you like to come? Yes, yes, I'm coming. He believed that the Jewish experience, and this resonates with us today, was intertwined with the black experience. I bet it wasn't always popular. I have known that it was difficult for some rabbis to leave their congregation and go down and march. People didn't understand it, and Rabbi Shapiro didn't care what they understood because he understood that this world needed to be a just place. Whether he talked about climate change, nobody back then was talking about climate change or pled the case of the refuseniks out of, uh, out of Russia, or going down with mitzvah corps, or being one of the founding members of United Power for Justice. As Rabbi Kroloff wrote me, he was a rodfei tzedek. He was a person, rodef tzedek, that pursued peace and justice. And he was a pastoral rabbi. You'd hear his voice, and you'd breathe a little easier just by the quality of his voice. Things were a little softer when he was around. He knew your name, he knew your mother's name, he knew the wife of your uncle's name. He was what we called that non-anxious presence. Not because he wasn't anxious, but because he was able to bring in a calm and hold a container of peace when your world was upside down and swirling around. He would hold you you felt held. He was a teacher and a mentor and ignited the spark of Judaism within the souls and draw so many, drew so many of us out of the ordinary into the extraordinary life of rabbi, cantor, educator, executive director, Jewish professional, not to be afraid to step into the center, but to delight in it. Letters, emails, Facebook posts. He taught us all how to preach, tell them what you're going to say, then say it, 
and then tell them what you said. He taught us how to show up. They may not remember your sermon, or they may remember your sermon, he would teach us. But they will never forget if you reach out or go visit. He taught us how to lead by pulling back, by letting leaders become leaders and emerge. He once said to me, never go two steps ahead of your people. As a matter of fact, if you do, they will yank you back, but never let your people go two steps ahead of you. Shoulder to shoulder is how you lead. And yet he could create space for Chavarot. The Chavarot of BJBE that Rabbi Shapiro founded still say, oh yeah, they're in my Chavara. You still identify as those groups that he created or created the space so that you could create. Searchers groups. Still meeting till to this very day. People teaching each other. One of our colleagues wrote me, he said, at camp he was asked, so what is your Hebrew name? And he said, he answered, well, my name is Marzuta. Who's Marzuta? Exactly. A Talmudic scholar that nobody knew about. Mark was humble. Who are you? I'm nobody, who are you? He would never have believed everything that I am saying right now. He would never believe that he was called the most beloved of his class. He was our rabbi and our mentor and our inspiration and our moral conscience, our comfort, our teacher, our voice that told us what to do right and how to behave holy. And that's for all of you. But for you, he was your father. He was your world. You were his world. Steve, it's so powerful that you knew that you can carry with you for the rest of your days that you were the joy of your parent's life. What a gift that is that a parent can give to a child. When you came into the house, you lit up the house. You described yourself as a frightened, shy child, but you also learned that one of your great talents was to make people happy because you made your parents happy. You wrote a stunning piece of what it is that he taught you. Some of it I'm going to read now. How to cat throw and catch a baseball. How to be humble. How to use the right amount of humor in the right situation. How to love unconditionally. How to drive a car. How to drive a car with a clutch. How to build a rickety sukkah that can last for a week but not much longer. How to be loyal how to be warm. This list that I have in front of me is a map for being a good human being. Elliot, you thought that all fathers were like your father. Wake up in the morning, put on a tie, leave, come back, play with you a while, and then go back out again at night. I think back in those days, meetings started like at 8 or 8.30. That was not easy to do. You thought all our fathers carried tours in their trunk. You never understood why at the high holidays, he would take that particular moment to teach you three boys a lesson, talking exactly just to you until you realized that everybody actually felt that way, that they were all being talked to. He always had time for you. And though he always worked, it never felt like he was absent. If you needed him to be there, he would be there. Like Noah said so beautifully, he would even play games he didn't particularly understand. 
He was the dad that threw the ball around. David, you, you said that you aren't like your brothers. But I have to tell you that your brothers aren't like each other either. And that's one of the unique things about this family, truly any family, that the success of parenting is when a parent, a father, particularly to his sons, can see you. You. You said you had a temper. Your words, a bratty kid. But he understood you. He knew you. And he decided to create David time. Saturday afternoons, it may be watching TV, or it may be in a car when he went and had pay, played, paid a condolence, and you sat and waited for him. Your father loved to watch you laugh. You three, you are proud to be what we like to call in the profession an RK, a rabbi's kid. They didn't force anything upon you. You felt ownership. You felt privileged. Everybody loved him, and he was yours. Playtime was real time. Omelets, eggs Hollywood, ball games, reading to you. He had the unique ability to make you feel so special, every one of you, as if the other didn't say it, said to me, you know, we gave him such joy. We, he, his eyes would light up when we entered the room. You have been faithful and devoted sons. Hannah, you must be so proud of the way that your family has come together. The grandchildren, unconditional love, support, indulgence. The relationships weren't always easy. They weren't always smooth. But one thing that was amazing in this family is that you never walked away from the table. Back starting when you learned how to practice forgiveness, you never walked away. You always gave love a chance, always forgiven. He had x-ray vision and taught you to have x-ray vision, to see one another. It is no secret that Rabbi Shapiro suffered from depression. It's not a secret because he told us. He stand, stood on the beam and he says, you want to know who I really am? And people said, yes, we know who you really are. And that complexity of his inner soul, the light swirling with the darkness, made him compassionate and humble with no sense of self-greatness he absolutely used his pain to ease your pain. The last weeks of Rabbi's life were very precious. You were all there all the time. I guess two Shabbatot now, I came over and started doing Shabbat with you. And we sang, Shalom Aleichem, I remember he told me that when he was in hospice, he used to sing to people. So we sang, Shalom Aleichem, welcome you angels of Shabbat. And though he couldn't form full sentences, he could say, welcome you angels of Shabbat. And at one point, at first I thought he was looking at Natalie. And then he, I realized he was looking past her. And he said, yeah, I see you. I see you, angels of Shabbat. You sat by his bed and stroked his arms. He grabbed your arms with the strength of love and pulled you close to him. You laughed with him. 
the children, the grandchildren were never far away. You said, you know, he taught us how to live, but now I understand he was teaching us how to die. And when we prayed together, the hashkivenu, hashkivenu, Adonai Eloheinu l'shalom, God spread over me a canopy of peace. Let me lie down in peace. He uttered the words along with me. And that was his acknowledgement that he knew what was happening. He was teaching us what matters. And now let me tell you what he'd want me to say to you. Do you know what matters in life? You matter. Me of little and humble spirit. You matter. You, the congregation. You, the student. You, the colleague. You, his brother. You, his friend. You, the children, the light and love of their life. You matter. You, the grandchildren, the next generation. You matter. The Pentala Yid the light inside the Jewish heart, that matters. The spark in every person, that matters. And so let us end in this moment by saying, Hannah, we are so sorry for your loss and so grateful, so grateful for the partnership the two of you had. Because he must have understood this back at the water fountain and walking down the paths of us, Rui, it really, really does matter who you marry. And he made the perfect choice. And it's time to say, I guess, weeks before Rosh Hashanah, close your book. And yet, and yet, the book of life is always open. And the legacy of a kind, brilliant, humble, honest, genuine man will continue from generation to generation, the door of a door. We will always sing his praises. May his memory be for a blessing. Please rise.
compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Rabbi Mark Shapiro, for he has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in your eternal presence and comfort in the shadow of your wings. Let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace, as we all say, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The interment service for Rabbi Shapiro will be at Zion Garden Cemetery, the B'nai Jehoshua section. The Shiva information you'll find on your service folder and memorial contributions in his memory to his congregation, B'nai Joshua Beth Elohim, Olin Sang Ruby Union Institute, or Yad Lakashish, the lifeline for the old in Jerusalem. All that information is on the service folder. And for those of you who are online, you can find that on the B'nai Joshua Beth Elohim website or the Chicago Jewish Funeral Home website. For those of you who are here and going in the procession to the cemetery, the procession will be forming in the parking lot. Please obtain an orange safety funeral sticker to place on the right-hand side of your windshield. Have your bright lights and hazard lights on at all times. For additional measures of safety, we will be providing many of the cars with a flag that will be affixed to the top portion of your car. We'll have a car in the back of the funeral procession to hopefully keep other cars from entering the procession. And for your own personal safety, I strongly recommend not using your cellular phone for texting or speaking. This time, I ask everyone to please rise and stand in place as we escort the casket of Rabbi Mark Shapiro from his sanctuary. And then we'll return to our cars. 